Our scripture reading today is from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. And Philippians is a short, short book, actually it's a, it's a letter, a short letter that Paul writes to the very small church in Philippi. He writes it from a jail cell, from a prison. We assume it's the prison in, in Rome in which he is executed. But Paul had a habit of getting himself thrown in jail, so we're not absolutely sure it was from, from Rome, but we're pretty sure. So out of this circumstance of a man who was in prison and who the empire is threatening his life, and most importantly what he loves, which is the, the church and, and the church of Christ, Jesus Christ and the the message that it brings to the world, he is still incredibly, remarkably uh, positive. And he's writing to the, to the church in Philippi and he addresses a couple of things. One of them, we know that there's a, a little argument going on. It's not a little, it's a, anything such as a little argument. You know, I don't, uh, but there's a disagreement it's, and it's between two very important women in the church who are church leaders. And it's good to be reminded that when you read the book of Acts, we find that really the church in Philippi was started by women. It was uh, Paul meeting women outside of the outside of the city, city walls, and who were having prayer. And with them, he started the church of Philippi. And so when we begin, begin to think about there's no uh, uh, women leaders in a church, then maybe we should just rip out the book of Philippians in the Bible uh, because it's pretty obvious without them um, it would have been hard for this church to become and to prosper as it did. So in the midst of this, Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Sinteki to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes. And I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. Together, Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, wherever is, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that I have, that you have learned and have received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The God of peace will be with us. How often we struggle and we need this God of peace to be with us. In the turmoil that is life, in the, in the, in the hardness that is life, we need God to walk with us. And we are assured that God is with us. But sometimes it just doesn't seem so much like God is there. And God is asking for us to have faith in the times of the darkest times. To have love and compassion in times when we don't want to have love and compassion. Remember this letter, this message comes out of Paul who is in a very dark place himself. But his, his love and his compassion that goes beyond your simple understanding of what it is to live and to, and to, and to enjoy life. All of that should have been taken away from him as he sits in this cell. 
wondering if he will have a death sentence or if he will get to go on to Spain, which he so desires, where his heart is, is calling him to go. We have gathered together in the church as they gathered together in Philippi and as the United Methodist Church gathers together and then the world, in the world universal church of Jesus Christ gathers together and it seems so often that we really hadn't heard the words and the wisdom of Paul so well. For there is certainly victory and there is certain fighting, there is certainly sabotage among us and don't take that personal and don't start thinking, okay, who's he talking about? I'm, no. I'm preaching out of the gospel, but you know what? The gospel always seems to hold a truth in it. It always seems to hold up a mirror that we have to look at. Because if we don't, well then we'll really have something to look at. That's where we often encounter Christ. Is in the difficulty and in the hard times. And sometimes in our own foolishness. As we journey, we'll call this journey to the mountaintop and back. And I have to give a little bit of credit because earlier this week, Tracy was reminding me, you know, this would fit perfect with uh, that story of the time that we were in Colorado and just about didn't make it off the mountain. I said, no, no, I said, it doesn't work. Well, the more I went on through the week, it, you know, once again, she's right. And now that I've said it on film, I have to really live up to it, right? <laughs> But well, we, were, we were going on a, on a hike in the Rocky Mountain National Park, and we started out around 9,000 feet, and it was a 15-mile hike, and our climb was 2,000 feet. So for a couple of flatlanders like us, this just about did us in. I mean, we're wondering, as we're, as we're, especially the, the first, well, after about five miles, and there's this really steep climb, and we're trudging along, getting about 15 feet, taking a break, 15 feet, taking a break, and wondering, you know, that's when the prayers start going up. You're going, okay, God, come on, just, just get us out of this, will you? you know, I know I came here of my own free will, but just get us out of this thing. Um, so we continue to climb and huff and puff and, and get up to our point. And, and, and on this way, a, a young couple passes us by, a, a really nice couple, and they're on their honeymoon. And they go trudging right on by. Um, but we visit for a bit. Uh, then we meet them up. We meet up with them a little bit later when we get to the top of this, this area. And they kind of take a, I don't know, did we look that pitiful? <laughs> you know, we might have looked like, you know, we don't get this poor little couple off the hill, off the mountain, and they're just going to stay up here. I think they really were afraid for us. Uh, but then, so we work together. But we still actually had gotten to a point where none of us really knew exactly where the, the right trail was. And then there was a couple of guys that were camping out over there off the trail. They had their, their, their tent set up, and they gave us directions. And so we worked together to, to find the main trail. And there was a part of having to cross over some logs and water. And I was holding Tracy's hand on one side, and the other guy lifted off her his, her, his hand, and helped her get across. And, um, you know, sometimes you just really got to work together to get up the mountain, to enjoy the mountain, and to get down alive. Eventually, we, uh, we kind of, we knew we were holding them back, and we felt we were in a pretty good spot, and we kind of, ah, you guys go on. And there was a, a, a turnoff in the middle, of, after about another four or five miles, there was a turnoff that went back down the mountain, and they wanted to make sure that we didn't miss it. And so they piled up, I mean, they piled up this big bunch of rocks in the middle of the trail with an arrow. And they put a flower in it. <laughs> like, do not miss this poor old couple on the mountain. We don't want to read about you in the newspaper. So, God bless them. And we never saw them again, don't know the name or anything, but they're always going to live on in our hearts. Because just the compassion, just the joy. Uh, kindness, kindness goes a long ways in life. In fact, I'll say it goes a lot longer than rudeness, arrogance, and division, and all the things that so often turn out to be the way that we, quote, make it to the top in life are really the things that destroy life and really make you question how good life is. 
Because we've got to remember that in this letter, Paul is, is not only writing, he says, to you people who I love, he says, take care of this situation that you're having between you. You have two great leaders who are arguing over something. There's some division. It happens, right? It happens. It happens in a congregation. It happens in the, in a, the greater church. It happens in the world. It happens at home. <clears throat> and we have to have an attitude. For Paul will talk later about an attitude. An attitude that provides hope. An attitude that gives us the ability with God to find joy in hard times, to find joy in difficult, heart-crushing times. And in that joy, you work. And you work together. So that nobody gets stuck up on that mountain alone come dark. <coughs> we all still have to walk. If we can walk, <coughs> crawl, if we can crawl. Whatever it takes, we have to do our own part. But when we have a group of people, a body of Christ, a community, if we have friends and we have loved ones fully <coughs> together, then it's a whole lot easier to get down off that mountain alive. And by the way, while you're up there on that mountain, look around. Look around. As we rounded one bend, and of course we're already surrounded by great beauty, but we, we round one bend and there's what they call the, the Never Summer Range right in front of us. Oh, it was magnificent. It's, it's the first week of August and the, the, most of the mountain is bare but there's still some, still some, uh, some glaciers and some, some patches of snow and the, the clouds are just kind of wisping by and, and the rest of the sky is a, is a beautiful blue and it's just breathtaking. But at the same time, my feet hurt, my knees quit working five miles back, and I'm, and I, and I'm, and I'm wondering if my wife's going to make it down with me, or, you know, and then I don't know what the trail going down the mountain's going to look like, which was good, because if we had known what that trail looked like, we would have stayed up there. <laughs> but it was beautiful. A lot of the good things in life, we miss them. We miss them because they, they happen in what we call the darkness. We're afraid of the dark. We don't want the dark, and nobody does. Nobody wants the harshness of life. Nobody wants the tragedy. Nobody wants... Uh, in fact, I'll just say, I despise mortality because of love. But that is part of our living. And God is there. God is there. And it's so hard to see the divine care and love when it is so dark in our mind. When we're feeling so sick. When depression pours down in upon us. It is hard to see and grasp that light. But it is there. Paul is writing from the jail cell. He's writing to a church he loves dearly. And I think behind his words are some tear stains on the paper and, and some heartbreak because he says, oh, don't let this church fall apart. Don't let my work that I'm sitting in prison for be for nothing. And they just, this is my mind and spirit and thinking, but I was like, this is a prayer also. Come on, Philippi. Come on, you Philippians. You are one of the most stout little congregations that I have ever set up. You are the ones who in the middle of the Roman Empire that had very, very little to draw from. Surrounded by the, surrounded by the, the, the worship of the emperor and the worship of all the different gods. That you have stuck with it and become this one little bright shining star in the Mediterranean and in the known world at the time. Get past your differences. Yes, you're going to have them. But they don't mean you collapse. Yes, you're going to have them, but they don't mean you have to live them and live with them. I was watching um, a rerun of a show that 
almost, I hate to admit a watch, but um, it's a, um, don't worry, it's not like nine. Then The Walking Dead, I know, I'm sure everybody watches that, right? Anyway, uh, but they have some really good, they have some really good lines in that. And, you know, if you, everything I watch and see, I kind of think through the, the lens of uh, how does God fit into this and all that. But there's this couple having a discussion, and, and they're discussing on whether or not to have a baby in this awful world that is just, it's, it's apocalyptic, it's falling apart, death is all around them. And uh, one, of them, one of them mentions that, that fear is what keeps us alive. And the other one says, no, fear keeps us breathing. What does it mean to be alive? There's things we can do to keep breathing. But what does it mean to be alive? From the Christian perspective, it means to open up our heart and to let God in. It means to open up our will and to look to God to do the will of God which is often beyond us. It means to open ourselves that we can actually learn to love others. It's easy to love those we want to love. Jesus says that in the, in the Synoptic Gospels. He says, well, you know, everybody loves uh, their family or, or, or certain people, even the pagans. But the way of God is the way of loving the love of the ones who have hurt us, ones who have mistreated us. This doesn't mean laying down. It doesn't mean going out in the street and just laying down and saying, okay, here I am, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I love everybody, run me over if you want. No, it does not. Actually, it means if you find someone doing that, you go out and you pick them up and you carry them off that mountain to make sure that they're safe. Even when it's dangerous, or even when it slows you down, or even when it's difficult. That's what this whole letter is about. It's about togetherness. Paul uses the terms, or uses the conversation within the letter of an, of an athletic event. And he talks about the crowning, uh, the, 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 getting the laurel wreath, the crown that you wear on your head. But in, but in the ancient Greek, it wasn't just the athlete that received the glory. It was the whole city. They received it in the name of the city. In other words, it's all together. We are not Christian alone. And I, I will make the argument, and believe I can back it up very well, that Christianity was from the very beginning a community it is designed by God to be a community. And it is designed by God to be a community that loves itself and loves the world. And if you just think of the Ten Commandments, the first half of them are about loving God. The second half are how you treat other people and getting along in a community. And if you think about the great commandments, the two great commandments that we always like to lift up as Christians, but often forget in life, to love the Lord your God. How much? With all your heart, mind, and soul. All your heart, mind, and soul. Thank you. But I wonder what the other one is. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. It all is what brings it together. It is the powerful, active, Love that is a verb. Come on, Philippi. Remember who you are. Morris Memorial, remember who you are. Each of us individually, remember who we are. We are the ones who can go to God and do go to God when we're completely exasperated, when we're completely beat down and hurting, when tears are flowing and we send up to God our prayers that are through our broken heart and we lift them up and God hears them. But also God provokes each other to go and to help each other off that mountain or to help each other up that mountain or just to spend time with each other on that mountain. We are in this together, my friends, my family, my loved ones. This is a community, a true 
community based in the baptism, the joining, and the love of Jesus Christ. Go forth and celebrate and give this to the world.